Hi, thanks for being with me today. This is the fifth video in a series of videos that we've titled Masturbation and Orgasm. And the reason why we've uh, taken the word pornography out of the uh, title, uh, and we could take masturbation out of the title as well, and the reason we've taken pornography out of the title and started a new series centered around this matter of orgasm is because uh, we've discussed that uh, pornography and masturbation are simply tools or means or methods or strategies to reach the desired end. And the de desired end of masturbation and pornography is really the orgasm. So I really think that our interest in our uh, greatest desire goes beyond what we may enjoy men with pornography uh, and the masturbation. We really, uh, the, 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 the orgasm is really the thing that is most intense and the thing that's most pleasurable and the goal of pornography and masturbation. So if we, uh, if we develop a strong habit in those matters and even an addiction, then I would say that we are addicted to the orgasm and not to the masturbation and to the pornography. And I think that distinction is very important because lots of times and lots of ministries try to get men to cut off their uh, view of pornography when I think they're really missing the, uh, the central subject is that pornography is simply a means to an end. Similarly with myself, former uh, recovering alcoholic, uh, I could have stopped perhaps my alcohol, although I couldn't, but alcohol, too, was a means to an end, and uh, I learned about that end, um, and that was very helpful in me being able to let go and move on and start sobriety. <clears throat> but I'm going to tell you about that in just a moment. So, pornography and mas uh, masturbation are a means to an end, and if the addiction takes place, it's an addiction to the orgasmic experience uh, for reasons we've mentioned in previous videos. Secondly, we've talked about why or how, I should say, how a man develops this strong habit, strong craving, emotional dependency, addiction to this orgasm. And we saw that uh, the addiction is well-earned, well-deserved, a man over hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times of looking, masturbating, and orgasming uh, will develop a very strong habit. Uh, it will become a craving uh, on the desire level inside his physiology. And uh, it's not only something that he does hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times, but it's something that he turns to rely upon and depend upon and to, and to grow with, yes, even grow with and mature with, as time goes on. So that's where the, uh, the emotional dependency takes place as well. Now, we have also talked about this important fact, and that is... As one wise man has said, and additionally, as Paul has indicated to us in the scriptures, and as Jesus has indicated in the scriptures as well, that uh, or orgasm, this addiction and interest in pursuit of orgasm, uh, does not take place, the pornography and the masturbation, the orgasm does not take place unless previous to that incident, a man walks away from God, abandons God's, uh, puts his hands over his ears because God's tipping on his shoulder because he's not having anything to do with it. That uh, that sin of pornography and masturbation and orgasm uh, takes is the fruit of a man who down in the root has walked away from God and now is operating by faith and trust and reliance upon himself. And uh, what's going to come out of that heart is going to be sinful fruit uh, such as greed, uh, slander, pride, arrogance, and pornography, masturbation, and orgasm. Now, we're going to look at it a little bit differently today. Uh, I, want to, I want to propose to you that your interest in pornography and masturbation, and particularly with orgasm, of course, keeping that in mind, is that you really have a love affair with that, that orgasm. And that may be an odd way of referring to orgasm. How can I, I like it, I know I enjoy it, but, but do I have a love affair with this orgasm? Oh, Jeff, I think you're off base there. I don't think so. I'd like to try to persuade you about that today and tell you why I think that's the case and why it's important that you, if true, why it's important that you understand that 
as you consider watching these videos and probably watching because you're really interested in trying to disentangle yourself from this, uh, this entanglement that you've spent hundreds of choices uh, uh, making and decades uh, of choosing to um, participate in this orgasm, <coughs> excuse me, um, outside of the gospel and apart from God. Okay, so here's where, here's where I'd like to go with this this morning, take you back to my own experience with addiction. I grew up in a, a very alcoholic family. I have two sisters who grew up to be alcoholics, much to their disintegration and dismay and the, the, the trail of bad things that happened to them. And I grew up an alcoholic too. And God had uh, spent a long time trying to set me free from my alcoholism, but uh, we're going to get to that in just a moment here. But anyway, um, at the time when uh, God was trying to get me to diminish uh, my interest in alcohol, it was a long battle with God. But here's, here's where it really came down to the end. Um, <clears throat> There was a time that uh, it, late in my drinking when I became thoroughly and completely and 100% convinced that God said to me, Jeff, um, I want you to give this up. And I did not hear a voice. Uh, it wasn't written on a wall somewhere with a hand, uh, as in the days of uh, Daniel. But... And I want to make it very clear to you that after many, many years of drinking and cutting back and cutting back, because God really carved up me in such a way as I was willing to cut it up. But in the, la the bottom of the ninth inning, I came to realize it was the bottom of the ninth inning, God said this to me, and again, it was very, very clear to me. He said, Jeff, <clears throat> you're not drinking very much right now. As a matter of fact, you're drinking very, very, very little. But here's the deal. If you want to continue to drink, you've really got to give me up. But if you really want to have an intimate relationship with me and all of the covenant blessings that come by walking with intimacy and faith in me and the gospel, then you've got to give up alcohol. You really can't have both. You're either going to love one and hate the other, or you're going to love this one and hate that one. But you know what? I... I, I know you love alcohol, and I know you love me, but you know you can't love two things at the same time. And so you know what? If you really want to drink, go ahead and drink, but you cannot have me and walk intimately with me. And you're going to lose all the covenant blessings that come with me and with a man who wants me and who loves me, worships me, serves me, puts their faith and trust with me, and walks with me. But if you don't want me and all that comes with me in terms of those covenant blessings, then go ahead and drink. But you know what? If you drink, you're going to give me and those things up. But if you want me and those things, well, you're going to have to cease drinking altogether. That was, that was made extremely clear to me one particular night. And I took some time to think about it, which is indicative. That's uh, interesting to understand. But you'll probably realize how I came out in that. <clears throat> Maybe you won't. When I ask people, well, what decision do you think I made? Most of them have said gingerly, well, I, I think you chose God. And the answer to that is, no, I didn't. When weighed out, and, and let me be clear a little bit also about this. I had done a lot of drinking over the time, but at the bottom of the ninth inning, God made this decision. He told me this when I was drinking one glass of wine a week. I was drinking one very large glass of wine a week on Saturday nights because Saturday nights is when I could have that drink, and when I was at that drink, I would reach my desired end, and I would, that is to say I would have a good time, I'd be lighthearted, I'd be happy, and I'd be calm and anxiety-free and stress-free. And that's the goal. That's what I wanted. Now, I was willing to wait one day a week to have that. But nonetheless, God said to me, Jeff, if you want that one glass of wine a week, which is going to get you into your alcoholic calmness and happiness and anxiety-free life, go ahead, but you can't have me. But if you want me, Jeff, and all the covenant blessings that come with me, then you're going to have to give up that wine. You can't have both. Make your choice. Which one do you want? 
And uh, much to my shame, I tell my audience who's paying attention here, I chose the wine. Yeah, I chose the wine. I chose to give up God, my Heavenly Father, the Spirit in Jesus, and the covenant blessings for one glass of wine that was going to bring me a stress-free, uh, alcoholic-induced calm one night a week. That's pretty stupid. That's pretty crazy. That is, but that's why I call myself an alcoholic or a recovering alcoholic at this point. Is here's the reason why. Alcohol is not only alcoholism is not only a quantitative thing. That is, you can drink a lot, and that might make you an alcoholic, and probably will if you make hundreds of decisions over decades to drink like that. But sometimes alcoholism doesn't have to do with quantity. Sometimes it has to do with quality. And in this case, my love of calm and stress-free, anxiety-free living was more important to me than one then God was. Or in other words, God said, if you love me, you got to get rid of that. You, want, you love that, you got to get rid of me. And I chose that calm, free Saturday night induced by a one very tall glass of wine. I chose that over God and the gospel and his blessings. Now, why would I do that? Well, I would do that because I loved wine and the calm more than I loved God. It became very clear to me at that particular point in time. If somebody had said to me uh, for 20 years, Jeff, I think you love alcohol more than you love God, I would have said, you're absolutely nuts. Are you crazy? I mean, look at the life that I've lived, the way that I've followed God and done the things that I've done with his help, of course. But anybody... Up until that particular time, who had said to me, Jeff, which do you love more, God or alcohol? And I would have clearly, definitively, and aggressively defended the fact that I love God more than I love that calm that alcohol brings me. But God said, okay, you got a choice. Make your choice. And when I made the choice for wine, it became picture clear to me. I understood for the first time I loved wine. And the calm, more particularly, and the anxiety-free life that I could only get to the degree by that by drinking alcohol. I love that more than God. And that's what I'm trying to impress upon you here today. Guys, who, if you're doing pornography, and obviously that leads to your, uh, your uh, calm and stress-free and anxiety-free way of dealing with life, and that is the orgasm. Well, you know, your, your wife has pleaded with you to give it up. You haven't been willing to do that. Despite the fact, you, you certainly love, you, you've got to face the fact that if you are a married man listening to this, that and your wife has asked you 10, 20, 30, or 100 times to please give this up, and you've not been willing to do this, it must be very, very plain to you that you love this more than you love your wife. But if God were to say the same thing to you today, uh, Bob, I want you to stop orgasming through pornography and masturbation and outside of your marital experience. I want you to stop that. Uh, if you, but if you want to do that and continue to do that, then you can't have me and you can't have my covenant blessings that go with me now and forever. If you want me, though, you're going to have to give it up. Men, if God were to say that as plainly to you as he said it plainly to me, what would be your choice? What would be your choice? <clears throat> what I'm saying to you is, is if you've been spending two and three decades orgasming through pornography and masturbation, this may be a, the most difficult choice of your entire life. And you may make the choice that I made, and that choice being, I'm not going to lie. And what, when your push comes to shove, well, I do love God, but I'm, you know, I love God, but I can't. Most men would say, well, I can do both because I don't think this is a sin. God would never tell me that. Look at all the other things I've done for God. But God did a very gracious thing for me, and I hope through this lesson he's going to speak deeply to you as well. You can't have both. This addiction is a love. It's a craving, and you love it more than God. And I pray that God might say the same thing to you so it might become very, very clear to you 
that you, if you want to inherit eternal life, <clears throat> then you have to be willing to die to all things and certainly die to um, addictions of which you love more than, uh, than God. Well, um, I uh, took three months. I knew for three months, the moment I said no, I knew that God had withdrawn from me and I was in a perilous situation. For three months, two things happened. Number one, I was thoroughly convinced that if God came back, when I was in this state of choosing alcohol and the calm that came from alcohol over him, I was not confident that I would go to, to be with him in heaven. Galatians chapter 5 says, if you, love, if you practice these things, I warn you, those who practice these things, the people who make these things your habit, those of you who make these things your addictions will not inherit the kingdom of God. God's very clear about that. In Galatians, Corinthians, Ephesians, Revelation. Very, and I knew that I had practiced it, and I knew that I had made that choice. And so I was not confident. First time in my Christian life, I was not confident that if God came back, I, that, I would, that I would be with him. I was strongly suspecting that having chosen clearly, definitively, alcohol to come over him, that had he come back at any point during those three, three months, I, there was a very, very good chance that I was not going to inherit the kingdom of God, as the scriptures were very clear to indicate. Now, number two, knowing that and being very, very fearful of that, I began to do some very pointed reading some, some books that I had that really tried to get me to come to my senses and to realize the foolishness of choosing a glass of wine and the calm that came from that over God and eternity and intimacy and his blessings. And, and, and I mean, so I read and I read and I read and I read and I beat it into my brain and I beat the gospel in the brain, a truth, the truth, the truth over like a hammer, chipping away at it. Uh, telling me what an idiot I was and a fool that I was to give, to have this and to give this up. Well, long story short, after three months, I finally, I was laying in bed one night having read what I was reading, and I finally said, okay, God, I, um, I give up. I surrender and I submit. And from this point on, right now, I am never going to drink another alcoholic beverage as long as I live. I knew at that particular point that uh, my sins were forgiven, the weight of sin and guilt and uh, conviction was gone, and God reminded me of his great love for me. And uh, that was about 25 years ago. Um, I think I haven't kept track, but for about 25 years, I've not any, had any alcohol, alcoholic beverages. Have I been able to find that calm and that stress-free life in other ways? No, I haven't. The only way I've been able to find that calm is when I've had surgery and they pump you with that sedative before you go in for surgery, you know, and that's a great place to be. But other than that, I have not been able to eliminate that gut-wrenching generalized anxiety that's in my life all the time. Um, and I'm going to have to wait until I get to heaven uh, for that to happen. But God has, said, has convinced me, I would have said earlier, that God's grace was sufficient for me, as 2 Corinthians 12 says. God, my grace is sufficient for you. And I would have said, yeah, God's grace is sufficient for me. But I began to realize, no, that was not my practical theology. My practical theology was God's grace and alcohol is sufficient. And if I were to give up alcohol, I really don't think, I, I didn't believe that life, God's grace would be sufficient for me. But I did give it up. And I'm happy that I gave it up. And for a while, it was difficult to give it up, but it was an ironclad commitment that I've not gone back on, and I'm glad that I have it. Now, three months after giving it up, my brother-in-law, uh, Ed Huff, asked me, Jeff, how are you doing? How are you doing since you, uh, you gave up your drinking? And I said to Ed this. I said, Ed, and this is, this is some of you have said this as well. I said, Ed, I feel like I've lost my best friend. And that's what I was getting at in the beginning, and that is this, this relationship that you have with orgasm is a love relationship. It's a friendship. 
It's your most important friendship. It's your most important love. You love it more than anything else. It's your deepest friend. And you can't imagine life without it. And you may not choose to go on life without it. And that's why you continue to have this addiction, is because you love it so much you're not willing to give it up. Because you love it. And you, really, you think that life without orgasm is not a life worth living. And I, I, that's the way that I felt. Um, three months after giving up alcohol, I, lo I felt like I'd lost my best friend. And that's not unusual for alcoholics. Who, but eventually, uh, I came out of that stupor, didn't regret doing that, hung in there. And, um, and I understand now that that was a very, very foolish time in my life. But I was not seeing clearly as addictive behavior influences one's mind and one's heart, obviously. Well, uh, I was very happy that God did call me to give it up, and eventually that I did with this help. I hope this is helpful to you. You love orgasm. You're in love with your orgasm. You love orgasm more than anything else in the world. And that's why you haven't, you've had such a difficult time giving it up. Because giving it up means giving up the thing that makes you the happiest, and you can't imagine being happy without it. But I hope that God uh, challenges you in ways that he challenged me. There is life beyond orgasm, okay? Uh, as I, my life is an indication of that, my life is an example of that, the struggle and the failure with that, but God having pressed that home to me and my having given it up and eventually moving on, I'm, I'm delighted to... Uh, be able to be free from that entanglement. I'm happy to walk intimately with uh, the fellowship, and I once again have my assurance of my salvation. And if I were to die today, I'm confident that I would be with him, because I uh, I don't love him, and he, I don't love anything more than I love him. Hope to cross that finish line saying the same thing. But I would not have finished crossing the finish line uh, with alcohol. That would have uh, hindered me from crossing the finish line. But I'm thankful to God that he uh, worked so deeply in my life, and I pray that God will work very, very deeply in your life as well. And Lord, I haven't closed any videos yet with prayer, but I do so right now, asking you to take this truth, apply it to the men and the women who are hearing this particular uh, truth, and set, set men free, Father, I pray. The gospel that brings freedom, we pray that in similar ways you would set many men free in lieu and in light of these videos, including this one today. In Jesus' name, amen.